the five best ways to improve mitochondrial function if I have to put the a priority list one would be regular physical activity so try to do your eight ten thousand steps a day number two in short of intermittent fasting two meals a day with a very balanced nutrition profile probably does the trick stress big impact of stress on circadian rhythms and sort of how, how it impacts mitochondrial health sleep another big uh, aspect that imp- has a big impact on mitochondrial function at your cellular level and then the fifth is what I would say, sort of advanced nutritional supplementation, things like uh, urotene as we are chatting with, or even hitting on some, uh, you know, other well-known autophagy boosters. You mentioned spermidine as one, you mentioned other ways to boost autophagy. So there's no one magic trick. It's really a concert with different tactics that you need to apply. Well, folks, you've probably probably heard me talking before about something called urolithin A. Urolithin A. So you could find it in things like pomegranate and walnuts and raspberries, and my guest on today's show might know some other fringe sources of it. But it seems to be kind of becoming one of these darlings of the age reversal and healthy aging community, right up there with the things you hear people talking about, like NAD and C60 and astaxanthin and spermidine and fish oil and peptides and stem cells. People are talking about urolithin A now, but I've never really unpacked in detail on a podcast what it is because there's some subtle nuances in terms of its sources, its bioavailability, its dosing, the research behind it, and it's such a popular supplement. And you're hearing about it all over the place now that I figured I should do a podcast on whether it's a it's a reasonable thing to take in the first place, if you even need to supplement with it, and, and what exactly it is and how it works in the body. So I found a guy who knows a lot about urolithin A. His name, and I'm, I hope I don't butcher your name, Dr. Singh, because I got the I got the, the last name, S-I-N-G-H, but is it Anurag? Mm-hmm. Is that how you pronounce your first name? Yeah, you got it correct. You okay, can call me yeah. Dr. Singh. Nailed it. All right. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go with Dr. Singh. So uh, for everybody listening in, Dr. Singh uh, is an MD in internal medicine, but he also has a PhD in immunology because he's a total underachiever. And uh, he has worked with a bunch of different food companies, uh, including Nestle and different startups, including one startup called Timeline, which has done a lot of this research and development of urolithin A. Uh, and they actually claim, Timeline does, that urolithin A is, is backed by about 15 years of clinical research. And so we'll be able to explore a little bit today about what exactly that research is and what Dr. Singh has found when it comes to urolithin A, which, which again, like I'm now taking as a supplement, but I've never really done a deep dive into it. So this is going to be fun to get into urolithin A. Uh, you, you ready to talk all things, all things urolithin, Dr. Singh? Sure. I'd love to share it with the audience. Cool. What got you interested in it in the, in the first place? Well, I, I'm trained as a internal medicine doctor and, and for long, um, uh, I, I was practicing, you know, as they call modern medicine. And, and I realized basically that uh, a lot of uh, times when we were seeing uh, people with different chronic conditions, it was too late in the sort of trajectory of health function and health dysfunction to intervene. And, and I started working with a lot of natural compounds uh, as I was training to be a physician scientist. And uh, yeah, from there, the interest grew and uh, we started looking at uh, bringing the biotech approach to nutrition and stumbled upon urolithin A and it's a really great area of health benefits. So besides having a really weird name, what, what exactly is urolithin A? Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a metabolite uh, found uh, from, you know, sort of, uh, we all know the good foods that we eat, right? Things like pomegranate, walnuts, pecans, raspberries, all, all, all this uh, red and blue looking stuff that we have, you know, for long said has a packs a lot of antioxidants. Well, it does. So a lot of these antioxidants are polyphenols. They're uh, natural compounds that are enriched in these fruits and nuts. But when we digest them, our gut microbiome releases this metabolite called uh, urolithin A. So it's basically a, a food metabolite. Okay. So what's that mean? The gut releases a metabolite. Would that mean like the bacteria that are already in your gut would consume these foods or, or ferment these foods and produce some kind of like a, I think it's called a postbiotic compound. Is that kind of how yeah. it's working or what exactly is yeah, the conversion here that's going on? 
Yeah, so these antioxidants or polyphenols are very complex uh, uh, sort of aromatic uh, compounds. And so the, 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 when you digest or you're taking a glass of juice or a bowl of berries, your, your gut microflora uh, basically will, will digest them and, and sort of break them down into smaller uh, molecules that are more digestible and more well-absorbed and, and have health benefits for the host. So that's, yes, you're correct. This is uh, what I would also call a postbiotic compared to a pro or prebiotic, which is essentially the gut microbiome and prebiotic, the food that the gut microbiome needs. Now, based on that, I guess I'm wondering, you know, let, let's say I'm eating pecans and raspberries and pomegranate, weaving those into my diet so that I can then have the bacteria in my gut convert those yeah. into this metabolite, yeah. urolithin A, is it going to kind mm -hmm. of vary the conversion efficiency based on mm -hmm. my unique biome? Because you got companies now out there like probably Viome is one of the most popular. I know Genova Diagnostics has a test for this, but they'll mm -hmm. tell you, you know, the, the genetic yeah. composition of all the bacteria in your gut. And I'm curious if mm -hmm. there's a way to know your you know, kind of your, your potential for urolithin A production based on something like that. Sure. Yeah. So uh, basically we have done a number of clinical trials all around the world. We've gone into French uh, adult population. We've got into the Americans, the Canadians, uh, name it. And, and basically the best producers are the French. So they must be eating closer to the Mediterranean diet, rich in, I guess, a lot of fruits and berries and nuts, but they're also eating a lot of cheese and wine and a lot of fermented stuff. So, uh, we do see about 30, 40% people uh, in healthy adult population that have the correct gut microbiome. So you're right, you need to be eating healthy foods, but you need to have the right gut microbiome. In the American population, we did a study we published a couple of years back. It's actually very low. It's like 10, 12%. And even those who will make it would, would make a very variable range. So in most cases, it will be what I call sub suboptimal ranges that are hardly going to give you a, a health benefit. For example, uh, we also have developed a test uh, that I can accurately measure just with a few drops of, uh, you know, finger prick uh, blood swabbing sort of uh, in, on a filter paper. We can tell you uh, through very advanced uh, mass spectrometry methods if your body is actually naturally producing it or not and how much you need to be taking it. Uh, I can drink six liters of pomegranate juice. My body just refuses to make your latine as an example. That's interesting. This, this mass spec analysis that you can use on someone's blood, uh, like with a blood spot test, is that looking yeah. at the genetic makeup of your gut or your, or is it looking at urolithin A yeah. presence in the blood or what exactly are you looking at? Yeah. Yeah. So it's exactly looking at the presence of urolithin A in the blood uh, that you're probably exposed from diet. And it's a very precise test that we have developed. And, and the end goal of, uh, of that whole thought of developing the test was basically this molecule, this postbiotic, is is sort of the natural way for the body to to that exists. So if you have a very well functioning gut health, gut ecosystem, and you're eating right, you you're probably going to make uh, decent amounts of naturally urolithin A. But a lot of us don't, and so the tests you were mentioning that other companies such as Viome or others have will tell you your microbiome sort of spread, whether it's favorable. To, uh, whether it's rich and diverse. So we've actually done studies where we have looked at people who naturally produce it and what's their gut microbiome look like and those who don't produce, such as me. Uh, and the answer really lies in the complex gut microbiome, that it's you have to have a very rich and diverse gut microbiome. So you could do that analysis, but I think with our sort of uh, end functional output, which is urolithin A, we can tell you if you're, you know, your body is making the end product or not. Yeah, it sounds to me like you could skip a lot of the hassle with with doing like a full biome test of the gut if you can simply test your blood, you know, if you're already on a supplement that contains urolithin A or I guess perhaps some kind of a probiotic that might result in urolithin A production. I would imagine you'd want to stop that and then you could just test what your <laughs> levels naturally are and know. But But I'm just curious, do you think it's more that some people don't have the the genetics from an overall... Uh, uh, like a whole genome standpoint to produce urolithin A? Or do you think that these mm -hmm. these Americans, for example, who you mentioned are like 10 to 20% of them capable of producing adequate amounts mm -hmm. of urolithin A, that it's more diet or epigenetic or environmental related? You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I, I think actually it's more diet and environmental related and w- what kind of uh, exposure you had. For for example, I trained, I grew up in India, a lot of antibiotic usage early on for everything. You know, there's a big practice to give antibiotics. My gut microbiome just basically, I think, was destroyed forever. And try as I might to eat a lot of fermented food and a lot of fiber, I don't seem to be able to rewire it. Now, those who are blessed, as I call them, those who are producing and eating the right foods to nourish it, um, doesn't, you know, they probably are getting the exposure to decent levels naturally. Okay, got it. So would there be any advantage, and I realize this is probably kind of a a question that you might be biased about, (laughs) you know, working for a company that makes a product that supports urolithin A production, but would would there be any advantage if you were getting let's say, adequate amounts from your diet and you're eating things like these raspberries mm-hmm. and pecans and pomegranate and a wide variety mm-hmm. of fermented foods so you have the bacteria to produce the urolithin of, of, mm-hmm. of adding more. Like, like, where's the benefit in supplementing with more? Have you guys kind of dug into the research behind that? Yeah, we have. Uh, you know, I do work for a company, but before I'm trained as a medical doctor and, and I always say diet and, and exercise are the two pillars of, of your key health to longevity, right? So, yes, I, I think if you're, if you can know that your body is producing enough urolithin A, uh, then you don't probably need to take a, a higher dose. You can probably just go on a maintenance dose and things like this because not, I assume not everybody is juicing four to eight pomegranates every day to drink a glass or two glasses of pomegranate uh, every day. That sounds exhausting. Yeah, and you get the sugar exposure, a a glass of juice is about 30 grams of sugar. So, uh, yes, people should eat uh, raspberries and pecans and walnuts and other good sources. And and if their body is producing urolithin A, then... You know, that's why we developed this test. They can actually, you know, develop uh, a maintenance dose through dietary supplementation. Those who cannot, which is apparently a majority of us, um, then they need to rely on direct calibrated supplementation. You know, things like vitamin C. We all know our orange juice is good for you, has a lot of vitamin C, yet a lot of people take vitamin C supplementation, right? Um, and, and so that's that's the way I look at it. Yeah, yeah, back to similar reasons you outlined. Maybe somebody is watching their calories and doesn't want to have as much of the pomegranate juice or fructose containing foods, et cetera, which I know in the low carb community is kind of a thing. But, you know, kind of a nerdy question, I suppose. But let's say I were to yeah, test, yeah. do you happen to know what reference ranges would be for adequate urolithin A levels that reflect some of the performance and recovery and mitochondrial benefits of something like elevated levels of urolithin A? Yeah, so we've looked uh, quite deeply, um, both into the microbiome and exhaustively into the blood levels, uh, both uh, from, let's say, natural dietary exposure and, and, and with increasing doses of direct supplementation. And we've published these in really top journals like Nature Metabolism. So we, we start seeing really big effects in different human sort of trial, randomized clinical trial settings at about 500 milligrams. So uh, this compound hits your mitochondria and kind of rewires them from being poor looking mitochondria to healthy mitochondria. Uh, and, and, and we can tell, and we can tell that difference in four weeks, uh, through blood biomarkers, et cetera. But really the functional benefits you start seeing at about two months of supplementation. We do see, uh, levels between, let's say 10 to 100, uh, nanograms, uh, uh, per volume of, let's say, plasma that we can measure it would be the dietary exposure. Uh, okay. About 2 to 5% people do have higher than that. With, let's say, direct supplementation, you can't consistently reach that. Uh, 100 would be, let's say, the, the, the lower limit, and you'll always get about an average about 300, 400, which, you know, there's a concept called a therapeutic range that we call in, in medicine. So you always need to have enough exposure to the molecule and sufficient doses to to sort of have the the health output. And that's what I believe you always need to maintain your blood levels at. Yeah. A lot of the research I was looking at leading up to this call, digging in a little bit, seemed to agree with what you just outlined in terms of around 500 milligrams of daily supplementation being something that elicited a lot of these performance and recovery enhancing effects. And I even saw Uh some, particularly in the muscle endurance and performance realm, uh, albeit I, I think it was like with finger contractions and 
and uh, you know, in, in human models, which might not translate directly to like you know Ironman triathlon or something like that. But they were up around a thousand milligrams as far as the daily yeah. dosage goes. And I, I would love to get into some of the performance implications here in a little bit. But just backpedaling, what exactly is yeah. urolithin A doing from a, from an action mechanistic standpoint in the body? Okay, great question. Yeah, so uh, you you touched upon it. You talked about NAD. You talked about Q, CoQ10. There are um, mitochondrial boosters out there. So think about the life cycle of a mitochondria, right? We, we all are always ourselves, uh, typically uh, highly energetic cells like your skeletal muscle, which is always moving, uh, which is always kind of climbing stairs, or a neuron cell, uh, which is always kind of active. These are cell types that have thousands of mitochondria, so they have a very high, basically, metabolic demand. And so there's always a flux of healthy and poor healthy or bad functioning mitochondria. But what happens is, uh, is in the life cycle, healthy mitochondria accumulates what we call as uh, oxidative stress, becomes damaged, and then over time, it becomes really crummy. Now, with things like aging or if you get injured and you're lying on a bed, you just shift the balance to more crummy looking mitochondria uh, in your cells and in your system. And if you're not cleaning those faulty mitochondria, think of you know it as uh, the trash bin in your house. If you're not cleaning your trash out uh, regularly, your house is not going to smell right. And that's exactly what happens in, in muscle cells and neuron cells and heart cells with aging or with obesity, for example. They just accumulate a lot of mitochondria. So you could do NAD supplementation, which is targeting what we call uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, so trying to grow more healthy mitochondria. Uh, or you could do things like CoQ10 or, or L-carnitine, which is just taking the pool of uh, functioning mitochondria and making, trying to make them make more energy. But unless you clear out the waste and there's space in your mitochondria, uh, and this is a process we call mitophagy, which basically is like aut autophagy of the mitochondria, so okay. garbage disposal. So what urolitin A does is revs up mitophagy, cleans out the faulty mitochondria, and now you have basically newer building blocks for newer healthy mitochondria. Okay. Okay. Got it. So with this mitophagy, then arguably most of the effects we're seeing with urolithin A in terms of its impacts for recovery or longevity or performance are based mm -hmm. on enhanced health of the mitochondria due to mitophagy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does 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 mm -hmm. mitophagy yeah. result in in greater amounts of mitochondrial density or, or number of mitochondria? Is it impacting simply the quality of the already existing mitochondria or what exactly is going on there? It's doing actually both. Uh, we do see higher mitochondrial abundance uh, just because you're creating, uh, as a result of mitophagy, you, you will clean the waste out and you will see things uh, impacting mitochondrial biogenesis. So you will have more ab abundance of healthier mitochondria. Uh, but what you do see is mitochondrial quality go up big time. Uh, and just that just means that the cell is more energetic, your cellular health is more optimal, and, and that has implications beyond just improving mitochondrial health and to muscle performance and recovery, as you said. Yeah, I'm curious what you guys have actually seen or, or what you've seen in terms of the implications for mm -hmm. this as far as enhanced mitophagy from something like, you know, let's say that standard dosage of 500 milligrams or so of your lithium mm -hmm. consumption. Yeah, so we have run a number of uh, randomized control trials, uh, placebo control trials. Uh, we've run it in older adults, uh, about 65, 70-year-olds. We've compared uh, those even doing uh, regular exercise, about you know those 70-year-olds who are doing 60 minutes of running every day to the frail sort of uh, couch potato uh, sedentary older adults. And we've given those sedentary older adults uh, uh, about a, a 500 milligram or a gram of urolitin A. And we've able to see basically a similar exercise mimetic-like uh, impact on mitochondrial and cellular health. And then we have gone into longer duration trials in, in for example, 40, 50-year-olds and even older adults again, and, and really seen, the, uh, I, I think you mentioned uh, some of the results on the sort of hand contraction. Believe it or not, one of the first muscles that declines with aging is this one. So you know, your grip strength basically um, is the first uh, loss. Uh, and that's why they say a handshake goes a long way to predicting your, your longevity. Uh, and it's basically that. So we have seen uh, not just hand grip strength improve, but even leg endurance uh, improve. And then we have put people on our, 
ergometer and see uh, and seen that they basically have a resistance to fatigue. Twenty percent more, they they walk more uh, in the let's say if you do a standardized walking test. And uh, yeah, they, most importantly, you can measure it with very simple tests like peak VO two, for example, goes up ten percent in a non trained population. So these are some of the effects we have seen. In addition, we have seen also some of inflammation markers. So as we all age, or if we are not eating well, our bodies get inflamed and things like C-reactive protein go up. Now there's a big interaction between mitochondria and immune health. And so what we see is actually down the road with longer, a gram sort of supplementation, even other benefits coming out. Interesting. So, so up to a thousand milligrams or so, you can see even greater benefits from a performance standpoint. Some uh, research study I found. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what we are seeing now. Yeah. Any, any side effects? I mean, I'm curious if this is causing a, a shift in the gut bacteria in terms of their postbiotic production. You know, I, I, I took mm. some of the timeline stuff. Uh, namely, I like that little powdered packet because I could just dump it into my morning smoothie. I know you guys have a whey mm-hmm. protein as well as, a, I believe, a soft gel that contains some of these urolithin mm-hmm. A precursors. Mm-hmm. But if, uh, if, if you take it, do you ever notice anything like, a, like gut side effects or any other side effects from a higher amount of urolithin A consumption? That's a great question. So what, what safety, you know, we, we have really characterized the safety aspect very well. Uh, before we actually went into humans, we did a whole battery of safety tests that we vetted with the, even the FDA through a process called as GRASS, which stands for generally regarded as safe. And basically, even in those uh, uh, experiments that we did early on, just even giving it like 5% uh, equivalent in the diet didn't have any impact. And in the humans, of course, we've done Gosh, about thousands of uh, folks who have been in our randomized trials by now. And really, this is a natural molecule. So, you know, as we were discussing, about 30, 40% of us have been making it. A lot of us were probably in the evolutionary tree when, you know, when we were eating fresh food and eating out uh, sort of in the wild with berries and nuts. We were all probably exposed to it. So it's a very safe molecule. We haven't really seen um, any product related. Uh, uh, adverse effects now certain people may have some allergenicity you know for example uh, a lot of people when they take the rice uh, based or the berry uh, based uh, product may have some sensitivities to food ingredients but as, as a compound it's as a pure natural compound it's very safe now based on the gut thing i'm curious you know there there's mm-hmm. some companies out there i would imagine some are competitors to timeline that make probiotics yeah. that promise to shift the gut bacteria in such a way that you naturally increase your own urolithin A production. I think that, um, for example, the uh, the seed symbiotic is one that I think I've seen that type of uh, that, that type of claim on for the urolithin A production. It, what, what's the difference mm-hmm. between your product and a product that would be more of like a like a bacterial based urolithin A support? Yeah, I, I just think it's the it's an indirect way, right? You, 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 and for example, I've been running clinical trials in the nutrition industry for 20 years. I started actually a lot of trials um, that you can probably pick up on probiotics uh, are probably trials that I ran about a decade back. Uh, problem with probiotics is if you're taking these billion CFUs, hoping that uh, a certain percentage of them will colonize your gut. Uh, and, and we've looked at the gut. Uh, I spent a good amount of five, six years trying to study what is that bacteria the gut microbiome is so complex, right? It's never one bacterial strain or two bacterial strains or 10. It's really the whole ecosystem needs to be there. So I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's as I said, if you can induce your A production through diet and probiotics or eating fermented foods, by all means do it. Uh, but I just think for a majority of us, the that indirect way of supplementing will be imprecise and, and that will lead to a lot of variability in not just human clinical trial settings, but in real life, with direct calibrated supplementation of 500 milligram or a gram, we know what we are giving and what levels we, we expect, and and those are probably leading to more consistent clinical trials or real life results. Yeah, I, I need to actually try this blood spot test that you mentioned because I take the seed probiotic. I take three of those little capsules mm-hmm. when I get up in the morning, mm-hmm. but then I've been putting the powder of urolithin A into my smoothie, which I have like five mornings a week. So it'd be interesting to actually test my levels, yeah. both with and without the sure. the uh, the the, mm-hmm. um, the the uh, seed, and then with and without the urolithin yeah. A, just to see 
Because I would imagine, I don't, I don't know what you think about this, but it seems to me like you can potentially do both, right? Support the gut bacteria and also supplement in the same way that you could eat a wide variety of fermented foods and then also weave in things like the pomegranate and the raspberries and pecans, et cetera. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, I, I agree. And that's why I said, you know, I, I really see this as, you know, uh, part of the, of the three pillars of human health. One is you need to be exercising regularly. You need to have a, a good diet, rich in fiber, probiotics, vitamins and minerals. And, and then, you know, at the base of this is the third pillar, which is really adding on sort of very advanced calibrated supplementation that is boosting your cellular health and will help, uh, I don't know, better nutrient absorption, for example, or better cellular health that even, you know, you will uh, have better additive effects. So I, I do think uh, there's merit uh, into doing a complementary approach. Yeah, you, you say advanced supplementation. How is, how, how is Timeline's product any different? I guess I'm curious if you've somehow patented your process or if there's a special form of urolithin A that you use. Is there anything that particularly differentiates Timeline or is it just these variety of delivery mechanisms like the protein or the capsule or the packet? Well, one thing we, we, we know the molecule in and out. We, as I mentioned, we've studied for 15 years. We have probably a whole array of patents protecting health benefits. Uh, but more importantly, it's it's how to deliver the molecule, Right. Um, it, it absorbs well in, in sort of lipid uh, medium chain triglyceride kind of matrices. So we have put it in soft gels that are that are sort of rich in these MCTs, um, and, and that helps even enhance the bioavailability of this uh, natural molecule. And so the and of course we have proprietary um, uh, ways to manufacture it. Uh, from scratch, so we know that the purity of this molecule is is over ninety nine percent, and we we do it with uh, really the top uh, manufacturers uh, that, that of course are GMP compliant and very high quality. Okay, that's interesting. So uh, arguably, taking it with lipids would be better. Like if I were to take it with fish oil in the morning, or if I were to have other fats like you know coconut milk or something like that in my morning smoothie, that's going to enhance the bioavailability. Yeah, we've done even a head to head with, you know, it needs a sort of a food matrix uh, protection. So we've done uh, a trial with uh, mixing it with high protein skier like yogurt. So like Icelandic yogurt is very rich in whey protein and, and sort of branch in amino acids. And that gives it a sort of a uh, better effect in sort of protecting and, and, and the digestion of it. And that's one of the reasons why we blended it with the whey protein. Uh, if you mix it and blend it with the fiber, it also helps. But I, I, all the trials actually have mostly been run with the with the MCT formulation and soft gel. So I do okay. think that gives it an edge in terms of uh, a little enhanced absorption. Okay, got it. Now, what about the transdermal part of things? You know, I, I noticed that you guys have a skin product. You sent me like a day lotion and a nighttime cream. Is that actual urolithin being applied to the skin? Yeah, it is. It is. So for long, you know, when I would go to top conferences and pre present at top medical conferences, everyone would, the first question everybody would ask me, well, what will I feel? Uh, you know, how, how do I measure mitochondrial health? Uh, and I would say, well, you would measure it kind of subjectively because you'll feel more energy, you'll feel less fatigue. If you really want to test it out, you, you, you'll measure your sort of VO2 max and by going on into a special lab that can put you on a treadmill and hook you up with all kind of, uh, you know, measuring instrumentation. So people say, well, but what, what will my first thing, will I see it in the mirror uh, that I'm aging less? And I said, well, this is not uh, a youth in a pill or exercise in a pill. This is improving, uh, you know, hitting many of the pathways that are important for cellular health and recycling. And so, that's those questions also triggered well what will it do it's just not the muscle cells that are abundant mitochondria our, our skin cells have a lot of mitochondria our immune cells have a lot of mitochondria so we started looking in these different verticals and, and really seeing if you're uh, when we would sprinkle it on uh, human skin cells for example from older donors we started seeing the same effects as we were seeing in muscle cells and that led to formulations and in, in sort of uh day creams and night creams and now we have just run many randomized trials again that we are trying to publish in JAMA with the skin formulation 
And what we see is basically improved cellular energy and less inflammation in the skin, which is practically what happens when we grow old is, you know, because of sun exposure, our skin uh, gets inflamed and wrinkles start appearing. So we thought, you know, skin aging goes in parallel with longevity. And so now we have products that hit skin longevity. That's interesting. So you'd see a difference between, say, oral consumption and the effect that would have on the skin versus direct transdermal application? Uh, that direct comparison we have not done yet. It's something in the works uh, to, uh, to not compare direct, but to even combine the oral supplementation um, with, the, with the direct topical administration. Now, the reason is that when you take something orally, about 80% gets absorbed in GI and then probably you know disseminates, but then the 20% that comes in, some of it goes to the muscle, some goes to the brain, some gets taken up in plasma, hits your immune cells. So probably, you know, all of it is not going to the skin. And so we thought, well, if we could do something synergistic and additive by applying direct, uh, a, a very calibrated, so that we, we're giving like 1% uh, urolitin A or mitopure in, in these topical products, then, you know, and we know it, it penetrates well in the skin and it, it hits uh, a lot of the skin cells similar to the muscle. So, yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting. And by the way, I'll, I'll link to this stuff if you go to bengreenfieldlife.com slash timeline podcast, bengreenfieldlife.com slash timeline podcast, because like I mentioned, they have a stick packet and a gel cap and the protein powder, and then they also have these transdermal applications. So a lot of different delivery mechanisms for this urolithin A, but there's so many other things out there. I mean, Dr. Singh, you know, in the introduction, and then you alluded to it, I mentioned NAD and C60 and fish oil and astaxanthin and all these other compounds. I recently interviewed Brian Johnson, who takes like, I think he, he said uh -huh. he takes like 120 different supplements when he gets up in the morning. He runs that Blueprint Age Reversal website. So I'm curious for you, uh -huh. you know, because it seems like you, you kind of have your, your ear to the ground for a lot of this stuff. Are there other compounds that you think would kind of like appropriately fall into an age reversal supplementation strategy that might go above and beyond? urolithin and if so have you been particularly impressed with what you've seen on any of these well i i, I think there's promise in the nad uh field quite a bit uh but but i do think that there's sort of a, a untapped synergy uh out there uh by combining a lot of people just blend and stuff the problem with the nutrition field is oh let's blend xyz and hope uh miracle happens I think there's a lot of uh, interactions between molecules, and so one needs to study that. Uh, having said that, I think if people were to think, well, uh, if you clean the waste away and, and then you apply something like an NAD booster on top, probably there's reason to believe that there will be synergy. So I, I do think there's merit uh, in, in all these molecules, vitamin B3, uh, nicotinamide riboside, or NMN that are uh, you know, kind of known to be biogenesis boosters. Uh, I like CoQ10, uh, even though the literature is mixed uh, because it's a molecule that directly goes into mitochondria and is important in the whole uh, sort of energy metabolism pathway. Um, and, and that improves efficiency of whatever healthy pool of mitochondria you have. And then I think uh, just the two best drugs ever developed uh, to improve autophagy, mitophagy are regular exercise and intermittent fasting. So you know, if people do want to boost autophagy and mitophagy, that, that's one additive way to do it, right? Um, and, and that's what, what I, I do practice also intermittent fasting myself. Yeah, yeah. a few days ago on Twitter, I, I published an interesting study showing that low-dose aspirin, of course, not only has some of the heart health benefits, particularly if you're careful not to combine it with a lot of other blood thinning agents, but mm -hmm. seems to induce cellular autophagy mechanisms in a similar way that fasting mm -hmm. does. And you know, I kind of like some of these autophagy or mitophagy agents that particularly for lean, active people, premenopausal females, et cetera, don't necessarily require hefty bouts of fasting, which I think can be overdone or mm -hmm. particularly problematic for the endocrine system when combined with a lot of exercise mm -hmm. or training for a triathlon or a marathon or CrossFit or something like that. And so I think that, that some of these things that you can do to improve mitophagy or autophagy separately from fasting can be a pretty good idea. Um, I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. for you, you know, it sounds like you incorporate some of this stuff into your lifestyle. What, what a typical day would look like for you as far as some of the age reversal strategies or mitochondrial support strategies that you do in addition to using something like urolithin? 
Well, I always say that probably the five best ways to improve mitochondrial function, if I have to put a, a priority list, one would be, first would be regular physical activity. So try to do your eight, 10,000 steps a day. Number two, uh, eat, uh, eat uh, you know, you don't have to eat a lot, uh, but uh, in short of intermittent fasting, two meals a day with a very balanced nutrition profile probably does the trick. Um Stress, big impact of stress on circadian rhythms and sort of how, how it impacts mitochondrial health. Um, sleep, another big uh, aspect that imp- has a big impact on mitochondrial function at your cellular level. And then the fifth is what I would say, sort of advanced nutritional supplementation, things like uh, urotene as we are chatting with, or even hitting on some uh, you know, other well-known autophagy boosters. Uh, you mentioned spermidine as one. You mentioned other ways to boost autophagy. So, yeah, I, I think it's really a um, – you, there's no one magic trick. It's really a, a concert with different tactics that you need to apply. Yeah, that's sound advice. I'd agree with all those principles. What, what do you do for sleep? How do you prioritize sleep or, or enhance your sleep? What's that look like? I stop looking at my phone screen uh, as I leave work and – I play with my kids uh, and that relaxes me and and uh, I go to bed uh, around 10, 30, 11. And I, 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 I mean, everybody's different when it comes to sleep. I, I honestly, myself, I was trained as a medical guy, so I, I'm used to doing more with less sleep. So yeah. I, I just need about six to seven hours of sleep. But um, I, I, I think exercise, I, whenever days when I do a five or 10K, I, I sleep the best. So um, and, and I do think that even with things like urotene and NAD supplementation, there is literature coming out that they have the potentials to sort of hit on some of the circadian rhythm um, uh, through bioenergetic modulation and results in better sleep cycles and people have more wakefulness early on. So it needs to be studied further. Yeah, NAD beyond the shadow of a doubt, particularly for me from an anecdotal standpoint, significantly Mm -hmm. combats any effects of sleep deprivation. I'll even use like a heftier like NAD oral dosage or a transdermal patch of NAD. I I get it from a company called Ion Layer when I need more NAD or if I'm doing long haul flight and want to combat some of the DNA damage. Oh, sure. And then creatine seems to act similarly, just a slightly higher dose of creatine. I usually take five grams. If I'm sleep deprived, I'll bump that up to about Mm -hmm. six to eight grams. What about urolithin A? Have you Notice that that seems to have any type of effect, either anecdotally or from a research-based standpoint yes, on anecdotally. sleep deprivation? Yeah, we haven't run any randomized trials uh, yet. There are some in the works. Um, but anecdotally, we've heard uh, people uh, waking up fresh. Um, uh, they're sort of uh, – they feel like they, they wake up early and they are much more fresher uh, early in the morning. But again, this is anecdotal. We are, um, you know, a lot of our studies are now kind of gearing up to, we've done a lot of studies, uh, clinical trials in older adults and overweight middle-aged adults. A lot of our new clinical research is, is moving towards more healthy. There's a study, for example, we, we are just doing in elite athletes. Uh, believe it or not, you would think that their mitochondrial health is optimal, um, but the problem there is overtraining. Overtraining also induces mitochondrial dysfunction. And we are even in the works discussing to do a trial with sort of the elite uh, army professionals and the Green Berets that have both uh, sort of the cognitive decline with stress and hypoxia and the physical demand. So we're doing a lot of um, work that probably you'll hear about in the next year or so. But I, I do think there's potential in those aspects. Yeah, yeah. For sleep deprivation, I've noted that noted that like acute dosing as soon as you get up in the morning. If we're looking at NAD and creatine, seems to be best for timing. Mm-hmm. But and and I would imagine your oath and A might be similar. Maybe take a thousand milligrams or something on a sleep deprived day yeah. and bump up your dosage when you first get up. And I'm actually going to experiment with that now mm-hmm. that I know and I'm aware of of its mm-hmm. effects on that. But what about for something like a workout? You know, I know a lot of these studies have looked into mm-hmm. performance, but What's the dosing? Yeah. Well, we talk about the dosing, you know, 500 to up to 1,000 milligrams. What about the timing? Is this mm-hmm. something that chronically accumulates in the body, like, you know, loading with creatine throughout the year? Or is it something that you can literally notice the acute effects of if you were to, let's say, take 500 milligrams for, you tell me, how long before workout? Yeah, so the way the kinetics of absorption of this molecule works, the moment you take it, 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 it takes about a few hours for it to start absorbing. 
and it really peaks in your blood about six to eight hours after you've taken it. So uh, most of our trials are, are done uh, giving to individuals in the fasting state in the morning with or without breakfast. So that would be about, let's say, seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And, and would start peaking, let's say, midday, mid-afternoon, uh, sort of. Uh, that's where we see um, a, a lot of, uh, let's say, the acute effects. But then it has a kinetic where its half-life is really about a day. So it, it kind of will peak at six to eight hours and then will start dipping down and, and, and go below what I call sub-therapeutic or sub-optimal levels of, of, uh, of exposure to the molecule. So you would need to then again take it the next day or bump it up even 12 hours after. So a lot of people, I, I, with the, with the gram, uh, so a lot of the recovery work is with the gram. So it, I was just telling you about uh, the study in athletes that was only focused on recovery. Uh, so a lot of these uh, individuals before a big season of competition, they go into training camps and, and they're all eating the same food. They're running downhill. They're kind of training in extreme conditions. What we are sort of seeing in some of this early data that is coming out is, is profound effects on recovery and muscle damage. So I do think that even in in sort of these settings, uh, recovery will be boosted in, in these sort of populations with this molecule in, in, a, in an acute way. So d- during training or post-workout would probably make more sense to take it. Okay, got it. You know, when you look at creatine post-workout, you know, co-administering with caffeine seems to increase absorption a little bit. We talked about with your yeah. lip and A, how co-administration with either lipids or perhaps even some type of a ferment or a probiotic might enhance the effects. But are there any other things, you know, a lot of my listeners like to stack stuff or know what combines best with what. Have you looked at any mm-hmm. research or even just anecdotally yourself looked into stacks, things that would go well when paired with your lip and A to either enhance bioavailability or enhance the mitophagy effect? Or, or anything else as far as kind of upgrading the urolithin A that you actually take? Yeah, I, I know that there is sort of this bio-optimization with the stacks and, you know, taking a few things and then building on top of, uh, in a protocol sort of that people follow. Uh, the, 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 you know, I'm a trialist and an evidence-based person. So we, we have studied is, is things, as you mentioned, the lipid matrix like MCTs probably, uh, that that's probably gonna. So if you are taking uh, sort of a keto diet, perhaps uh, probably that would result in improved uh, uh, absorption. A lot of folks are taking high protein. High protein does seem to have a very sort of uh, um, in, not in terms of enhancing, but a protective effect around the molecule. So we when we give it with high protein uh, shakes or or things like high protein yogurts, we do see uh, a bit slightly better sort of absorption of the molecule. And that could mean that it blends well with things like, you know, branch and amino acids like leucine, isoleucine. So those would be my top two things to stack with. And, and as we mentioned, other um, mitochondrial optimizers probably are additive as well, things like CoQ10. Yeah, I'm personally a bigger fan of essential amino acids than branch chain amino acids, which I think are kind of like overpriced flavored mm-hmm. water because you just have the isoleucine the leucine and the valine. Mm-hmm. I like the essentials because mm-hmm. you get all nine of the amino acids. Yep. And I, I haven't done much mm-hmm. experimentation. I've, I've tried putting it in whey protein. You know, what's funny is I haven't actually used your guys's whey protein, but I've used the Keon protein before mm-hmm. and combined that with your lip and A mm-hmm. based on some of what you were explain, explaining about it. Mm-hmm. It's seeming to perform pretty well when combined with protein. Mm-hmm. But your guys' whey protein, mm-hmm. is that a, is that something that you're just adding the urolithin to and it's just pure whey protein with urolithin? Yeah, th- that's the blend with the whey protein, and we are developing alternative protein uh, shakes as well as we speak. Uh, we are even running a head-to-head trial um, in, in sort of uh, individuals who are immobilized. So, so think of an athlete who's got injured, and we're giving them 20 grams of, of high-protein supplementation, seeing the effect it has on muscle, and comparing them to you know, how, how it will be in that particular population if you were to supplement with high-protein and the bioenergetic aspect with your lithium A. So we, we do think uh, there's synergy in the two uh, ideas to boost muscle mass and muscle quality and energetics. Interesting. What else are you guys studying up right now uh, at, at Timeline? Because you have the transdermal products, the protein, the soft gel, the stick packets. What else are you looking at right now, if anything? So uh, I, I'm a trained immunologist, and, and I do believe there's big uh, impacts of the molecule and the immune immune system. And so we, we have uh, uh, 
pretty good evidence already, but of course, uh, you know, since the mo- the big discovery of the molecule about a decade back uh, when we made and published our first papers, a lot of other top labs around the world have got interested uh, into studying its effects and cognitive health. So I would put probably these two are the most uh, at the top and getting in gut health because so much of it is getting absorbed in the gut that it, it must have. Uh, and there are some top obligations. But for, for, for the time being, the trials we are running, one is in uh, post-cancer patients. So typically, uh, though, um, let's say cancer patients have kind of cured themselves of cancer after chemo and radiotherapy, they basically end up with also uh, no immune system because the chemo and radio is hitting their, their functional healthy cells too. And so we're trying to see if we can rev up mitophagy in sort of the stem cells uh, that seed the immune system, and that will lead to a better seeding of the immune system because stem cells get exhausted in this kind of both aging and post-cancer. So that's one of the areas we're working. And then we're working with National Institute of Aging on really looking at the impacts on cognitive health and how we can boost brain energetics with the molecule. Do you think it would have any type of protective effect on stem cells? I just ask because a lot of my listeners, you know, they'll go out and do stem cell injections. And, you know, I always advise against flying on an airplane for a couple of days after and engaging in some strategies to enhance stem cells health, like, a, you know, PEMF and yeah. antioxidant rich diet, avoidance of vegetable oils, alcohols, all, all the things you'd do if you had little tiny fragile baby newborn cells floating around in your body. As far as urolithin A goes, do you think it would support or protect stem health cells somehow in that type of context? Yeah, I do believe absolutely. So there, there's a great paper we put out uh, in last year in, in probably the top immunology journal called Immunity. And, and the data is pretty remarkable that it, it targets this sort of pool of stem cells that uh, is always, you know, um, in our bone marrows and all the organs where the immune cells and the stem cells are, are, are sort of... Uh, sort of hanging out and, and they're activating mitophagy in these pool of stem cells really resulted in better sort of uh, receding of the immune system, re, you know, kind of even better muscle uh, stem cells. So we do think, so we are studying, uh, we have a lot of trials actually studying what you were just mentioning, the impact on stem cells. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. It's good to know. Maybe I'll throw up my bag for my next uh, my next stem cell protocol and load up with it. You know, related to this concept of mitophagy, Dr. Singh, you know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of people developing senolytics to prevent the accumulation yeah. of these so-called zombie or mm-hmm. senescent cells. But the idea is that quieting yeah. those senescent cells, particularly early in age when someone is going through growth phases, production of growth hormone, you know, higher amounts of, of anabolic type of activity that could be hampered by quieting cellular senescence mm-hmm. too much dictates that you wouldn't want to overdo a senolytic compound. And possibly even not do mm-hmm. a lot of senolytics early on in life. When it comes to mitophagy, mm-hmm. is it also like that? Like, yeah. is there a law of diminishing returns and in, in you know ex- excessively turning over mitochondria? And related to that, you know, an age at which that type of approach might not be advisable. Uh, I, I don't think so. So, so basically, the process of mitophagy uh, is. When, when, when mitochondria get stressed uh, and, and really damaged, they put out an eat me signal. On, and so if this is a mitochondria, it puts out an eat me signal on, on the top of its uh, su- uh, surface. And, and that's what uh, basically uh, w- w- when people are activating mitophagy through either urolithin A or exercise or other things, that's what is those tagged mitochondria that get then put in the sort of garbage disposal machinery and then these become the building blocks of healthy new mitochondria and that's a fundamental uh important thing to know is that you can overdo mitophagy uh you you can th- th- our, our cells are always in what i call mitohormosis so there's always a balance between good and and sort of the yin and yang so you 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 will always just take those faulty tagged mitochondria and then put them into more healthy mitochondria. And now you you know uh, and, and uh, mitophagy is always happening in sort of the in the it just slows down with aging. It slows down with um, a lot of other things like you know prolonged immobilization. But uh, we haven't really thought that over stimulating mitophagy will be. Uh, we haven't really seen it. I, I think it's more as a, what I call a modulator of mitochondria than than a uh, uh, approach than sort of overstimulating mitochondria. 
Yeah, I've always wondered if the body will have a natural modulation mechanism to where mitophagy supporting compounds present would not result in, let's say, excess mm -hmm. mitochondrial turnover just based on natural modulation, although I don't know what the mechanism of action for that would be. The idea seems reasonable, at least. And I'm, I'm curious, based on that, and kind of back to your blood levels of your mm -hmm. lipin A and this blood. By the way, where yeah. do you get that blood spot test kit? Do you guys mail it out from Timeline? No. So we are still, uh, you know, prototyping it. And there's a clinical study that I'm running with hundreds of folks to j just to make sure that, you know, we have the the sort of the right test to, before we launch it. But happy if you want to parse it, we can send you a, a kit and to your, some of your listeners if they are intrigued as well. Yeah, we, yeah we can that'd, offer be, that'd that be interesting well. to yeah, test. I'd, I'd love to mm -hmm. test based on what I was saying earlier. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hunt that down and link in the show notes if you uh, if you send me over more information on it. And again, the show notes yeah, are sure. Ben Greenfield, bengreenfieldlife.com mm -hmm. slash timeline podcast. But the reason I ask is, have you compared what gets your urolithin a levels highest the the little soft gel that you guys make the stick packet mm -hmm. or the whey protein have you broken mm -hmm. that out at all uh so so we, we have put them in those different matrices because we think all those different matrix uh help in the absorption so we have studied for example uh independently the soft gels in a lot of trials and also studied the the berry powder or now we're studying the the protein shake and, and i would say Within a ten percentile difference, you, they all in the similar uh, levels of boosting. Uh, as I'm mentioning to the the therapeutic range of 300, 500, and some people even more, depending on the dosing they're taking. So I think they are fairly um, equivalent. I would say. Okay. Have we not touched on any benefits or research that you're aware of about urolithin A that you think that would be important for people to know? There's a lot of excitement, as you mentioned. Um, we of course started doing the research 15 years back, but now, you know, I, I, I was approached by the national Institute of aging that said, Hey, we, we ran a library of thousands of natural compounds and, and repurposed drugs, trying to study the best effects uh, on, on neuron cells uh, where typically in things like Alzheimer's disease, mitophagy declines. It's well known in neuron cells. And, and we find, and we think your compound is, really one of the top inducers and really is neuroprotective. And, and so I think a lot of excitement now will come from these top professors and uh, Harvard has the same sort of research stream that I was told about. So I think that is the next big frontier. What are the levels that we can see in the brain getting into this molecule? If we can image sort of the ATP levels uh, within six hours of peaking and look at brain energetic capacity um, this is where I, I think a lot of research is headed now. Really. Okay. Interesting. You know, related to the brain, a lot of people take nootropics, they take smart drugs, they'll pop methylene blue, mm -hmm. do red light therapy, do a lot of mm -hmm. things that apparently increase activity of some of those cytochrome C oxidase pathways in mitochondria, mm -hmm. resulting in enhanced production of ATP, mitochondrial biogenesis, etc. I'm curious if you've ever thought about or if you know anything about the idea of well, if I'm making my mitochondria work harder, produce more energy, make more of them, if combining urolithin A with things like smart drugs, nootropics, some of these mitochondrial enhancing agents in terms of things that kind of like push the gas pedal harder would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you ever looked at that? We haven't, but I, I do think it's a good idea and something we, we are exploring uh, in the background. I, I do think there is potential in that to even combine it with certain amount of, uh, for example, even ketone bodies or ketone esters just to induce sort of uh, better cognitive effects uh, together uh, where you can recycle the poor mitochondria neurons and then give them a sort of a alternative fuel supply to, to, to rewire them. So we are looking into that. Yeah, I've, come, I've, I've, yeah. I've kind of discovered the same thing. If I take DHA and choline to replenish a lot of nutrients that I'm burning mm -hmm. through more quickly than ketone esters and NAD mm -hmm. on any cognitively demanding day on which I might also be using, let's say, you know, methylene blue or psilocybin microdosing or some type of, uh, mm -hmm. of nootropic agent like, you know, qualia mind or some of these nootopia products or something like that. I find that stacking choline, DHEA, NAD and ketone esters to just blast through, let's say like a 16 hour creativity slash focus work day with some of these nutrients on board seems to help, but I haven't really brought in something like a mitophagy 
enhancing agent into that equation. It'd be interesting to experiment with. Sure. Yeah. I think future research is headed that way. Yeah. Well, this is fascinating, man. I, I really appreciate the research that you've done on your and A and with Timeline. I, I know we have we have discounts and codes and things like that for Timeline. I'll hunt them down and put them in the show notes at mm-hmm. bengreenfieldlife.com slash timeline podcast. That's bengreenfieldlife.com slash timeline podcast. And over there, if you'd like, you can also leave follow-up questions, comments, feedback, et cetera, for Dr. Singh or myself, and we'd be happy to to jump in and help reply and point you in the right direction. But in the meantime, Dr. Singh, I really appreciate you filling me in on all my my silly questions about urolith and eggs. I've been fascinated by this for a while and kind of looking forward to getting you on the show and asking all these questions. No, they're all great questions. So love, love chatting with you, Ben. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm excited to put this out. And folks, again, the show notes are bengreenfieldlife.com slash timeline podcast. And until next time, I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Dr. Anurag Singh, signing out from bengreenfieldlife.com. Have an amazing week. <laughs>